Light of Patriarchs, Pray for Us, The Litany of St. Joseph, and EWTN. EWTN. Live True. Live Catholic. Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Hi. You know, we need to respect each other. I think that's one of the things that's lost, don't you think? Not everybody respect. That's where euthanasia comes. You have a terrible, terrible, terrible thing going on in California. It just seems uh, unbelievable that that people that, that this should even be on an agenda on on euthanasia. See, the slope has become more slippery in the Netherlands because. The quality of life, what, is, what does that mean, quality of life? Anybody want to explain that to me? Quality, what is quality? Is a, is a child quality of life, or is it because they're small, perhaps, or crippled? Well, what's the difference between uh, the Serbians who want to purify the nation of Catholics, Muslims, anybody who isn't pure Serbian. Now, see, what, what is the difference in that euthanasia? We're going to clear up, clear the decks of anything that isn't perfect. Imperfect children, old people. Uh, we're just going to have the best. You see, you, you've already become the worst. It's just so strange how how people think today. They're so utterly and totally selfish, selfish. It, we, we've lost respect for life. You see, once you lose respect for life, you re re lose respect for everybody. Next thing, they're going to have everybody with all those who don't have brown hair ought to be eliminated, you see. Well, wouldn't that make as much sense? All the diabetics, or all those that wear braces, or well, where does it end? You see? It, it doesn't make sense, and that's what the clue is. The clue is when something doesn't make sense, it's the devil. <laughs> I, it makes me nervous. And, um, but see, if, if enough people complained, they wouldn't insult you with all that rot. Programs that, that show such terror and, and, and real life horror. You, you, you just wonder why these producers, I mean, what is, if I respect you, then it's how I treat you, the things I would show you, means I respect you. I wouldn't show you a naked woman. I respect you. 
I wouldn't show you something gory and bloody. I respect you. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sing a song about killing cops. I respect you. I had a doctor, one of the doctors that operated on my spine was a Muslim. And he came in my bedroom, uh, in my room one time, and he said to me, do you mind if I pray here? And I said, oh, please, do. And he had a little rug under his arm, and he kind of knelt on the floor, put his head on the floor, and he prayed to Allah. He had just got through being in the operating room 36 hours. I think the average person would have probably just gone to bed, you know? I have to respect him. I don't believe what he re believes. But how, how, is we, how are we going to be one heart and mind if I don't respect you? If I have to, if you have to be perfect before I respect you, then how would I expect respect from you? Because I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. We have to love each other as we are. I was in a little group of people years ago. And we were always getting just chit chat and must have been five, six or seven of us and and um um, this woman was asking everybody what denomination they belonged to. It was pretty obvious what I was, you know. She didn't have to ask me. She said, oh, hello, sister. I said, hello. But this one woman said she belonged to the Church of Christ, and this woman's face went, oh. I thought, that's not right. It's a beautiful souls of the Church of Christ. See, you, we don't respect each other's tastes, and we don't respect each other's age. I'm 69. Now, are they going to have a certain date, you know, on April 25th when you're 72? We're going to put you out in the cold, and then you can freeze to death to give your space to somebody else. That's what the churches are calling now space. You see, we're going to have space. Hey, this is Tuesday night. I, 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 want to, I want to know what bothers you, what aches you. What makes you, what makes you rile up? Go on and tell me. I can, I'm always telling you what makes me riled up. <laughs> Feminists, inclusive language nuts. Uh, a lot of things make me upset. I want to know what does upset, what upsets you? Call and tell me. Maybe we can pray over it. Maybe we can help you in some way. There's a beautiful passage here in Galatians. It says here, if you go on snapping at each other and tearing each other to pieces, you better watch out or you would destroy the whole community. That's yeah, something. It's old Peter. Oh, Paul had his problems, didn't he? Huh? Nobody here snaps at anybody, huh? Yeah, you don't snap at anybody, huh? Do you snap at anybody? Nah. There's one honest man back there. He said, yeah. <laughs> but we do that. He said, let me put it like this. If you are guided by the Spirit, you'll be in no danger of yielding to what? Self-indulgence. He said, self-indulgence is the opposite of the Spirit. Did you know that? The spirit is totally against such a thing. See, too much drugs, too much alcohol, too much sex, too much everything. He said the spirit's totally against such a thing. 
And it is precisely because the two are so opposed that you do not always carry out your intent, your good intentions. See, if somebody is selfish, then they're going to only do what pleases them, and they don't care at all how it affects you. You know someone like that? They want to go out, they go out, and they don't care. They want to, if you've cooked a good dinner, and they feel like chit-chatting with somebody an hour, and it come, they come home, and you got to go through the process of heating it up, and it doesn't taste as good, they don't care. Somebody makes a nice pie, you decide you're going to fast. I know what I'd do if I made a pie, and my community decided to fast. <laughs> Right on their heads. They'd eat it one way or another. <laughs> if you are led by the Spirit, no law can touch you. Now, let me tell you what happens when self indulgence is at work. It says here the results are our fornication. You know what that is? That means you horse around before you're married. <laughs> is that a good description? Huh? You think that's a good description? Do you all caught on? Yeah? You knew exactly what I was saying, right? That, sweetheart, is fornication. It's a sin. <laughs> Gross, gross indecency. Boy, is that a biggie today. I think there must be a contest going on to see who can wear the least and get away with it. And some of the shapes that wear the least. <laughs> if I had those rolls of fat, I would... <laughs> I would hide it. I'd, I'd wear more clothes. I wouldn't wear less clothes. And those tight pants. You ever see those tight pants? They look like they're poured into them. I wonder how they get them on. And he, I, I've often, you know, I've kind of meditated on that, and I thought, it must be painful to... <laughs> And I've often wondered, does the excess fat roll up? <laughs> does that roll up when, when you're pulling that? It has to go somewhere. Because you don't see it on anybody. It just, maybe, does it come up here like a tire or what? And, and you, you know they can't be comfortable. I saw a woman about, you know, she looked about five foot four, but she had high heels, which made her about five foot seven. <laughs> and uh, I, I marveled, I kind of sat back a little bit, watched her walking. Her poor little toes, <laughs> her entire weight was on about five toes on each foot. <laughs> well, <sighs> You know, it's a, I, I guess it's style. Is that what you call style? Yeah? But see, everybody knows you're five foot four. See, that's the whole problem. The high heels don't change that. Now, I'm not against high heels. You know, I think if you want to torture yourself, you ought to offer it up, though. <laughs> I mean, why waste that wonderful pain in your feet? Uh, the old saints used to put uh, uh, pebbles in their shoes. And today, women wear high heels. And I, I think you ought to say, Jesus, I offer this in reparation for something. You can't be. You, you, your poor feet have to be yelling. And I've seen women like that, and all of a sudden, they kick off their shoes. You ever see that? No matter where they are, they keep kicking them off. I bet you pay a bundle for those spikes, too. The poor floor. I always feel sorry for the floor. It's like, ah! <laughs> Here they come. Anyway, we have a call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you from? This is Mary from Boston. You got a gripe? Mary? Yes, I have, Mother. Good, good. 
Yes, I have this friend of mine whose name is Fred, and he drinks a lot, and he fell yesterday in the bar room. He hurt himself very badly on the side of his face, his arm, and um, today he was very nasty. And I just called him when he got home, and he said, don't make too many phone calls. You see what I mean? There's lack of appreciation there, wouldn't you say so? Yeah, I would say so. I think the Lord was trying to tell him something, no? Um, something like that happened to Matt Talbot, uh, a man in Ireland who really drank a lot. And if I, 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 it's been a long time since I read his life, but it, I think what happened one time, he got dead drunk and he ran out of money. And there he was in the gutter, and he asked somebody for some money to buy a drink, and they would, and everybody passed him by. It dawned on him, what am I doing with my life? He became a great saint. And I, I hope they canonize him. If this man is bright enough, if he hasn't pickled his brain already, I think he ought to really stop and think. Look at himself in a mirror and say, what have I done to myself? See, this, is, this is not how God made me. You know, everybody gets bags under their eyes of fatigue and all, but you see an alcoholic after a had been drunk, he just looks horrible. You, you, you can't, see, we have to respect our bodies, don't we? We're talking about respecting each other. I got to respect my body. I can't abuse it. I got to, I got to render the whole thing back to God. But see, you'd be surprised what a lack of respect for life have done to society. Once I have the law that I can kill an unborn, by the same token, I can kill somebody who is old. You see, the, that it's the, the, the essence of selfishness. Okay, let's go on. What else is in self-indulgence? Sexual irresponsibility. Got a lot of that. Idolatry, oh. You know, there's all kinds of idolatry. There's, if you love yourself more than your neighbor, it's kind of idolatry. We had a lot of idolatry. All the New Agers say everybody's God. I told you, I thought that picture of Mrs. Buddha. Did you ever, did you ever see that picture of Mrs. Buddha? She didn't call herself that, but, you know, she had rolls and rolls of fat like Buddha does sometimes, and, and she called herself a goddess. That's idolatry, see? I think there are other kinds of idolatry. For example, if a man works so hard he neglects his family, isn't that a kind of idolatry? You want to get ahead? You're going after a thing, or going after an ambition, and, and to the neglect of your family, or your children, your loved ones. That's a kind of idolatry. There's, there's all kinds of idolatry. It's not just all these little things that people used to worship. Hey, we got another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. What, what's your gripe? Well, it's about this inclusive language. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think they, uh, they're trying to... Uh, call it a kind of respect, you know, for women, you know? Well, I just happened to have something tonight in case somebody called. <laughs> just happened, just kind of flew in my scripture here. Okay. One of the problems with inclusive language people is they misquote things. <coughs> Inclusive language, I understand, is that 
We don't use him, her, his, father, son, manhood, fatherhood, uh, that there's a sickness and all of that. Uh, if you cut the word father out of the gospel, you, you have big holes. That, that's, you're not respecting women when you do that. When a woman refuses to admit she is a woman, uh, then it, you're not, that's not respect. I don't know why a woman should be hurt because she can't do this or because mankind, the word mankind means everybody, men, women, children, babies. I want to read you something from, uh, it says here, in this little document here, it says, Galatians says that when you were baptized, it was as though you had put on Christ in the same way you put on new clothes. Faith in Christ Jesus is what makes each of you equal with each other, whether you are a Jew, a Greek, a slave, or a free person, a man or a woman. And what Galatians really said is, now that the time has come, we are no longer under that guardian, and you are all of you sons of God. <laughs> Through faith in Jesus. See how they took out sons of God? All baptized in Christ, you have all you are all clothed in Christ, and there are no more distinctions between Jew, Greek, slave, free, male or female. All of you are one in Christ. Now see if if you got this little thing here, I won't tell you where it comes from. But and, and you read you say, Oh yeah, Galatians says that. No, Galatians doesn't say that at all. Here's the worst. They misquote the Vatican documents. With respect to the fundamental rights of the person, <coughs> every type of discrimination, whether social or cultural, whether based on sex, race, color, social tradition, language or religion, now this is this, is to be overcome and eradicated is contrary to God's intent. Now they quote paragraph 29 of the document of the Vatican Council on pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. Now this is what the, this is what the document really says. <laughs> Forms of social and cultural discrimination in basic personal rights, personal rights, on the grounds of sex, race, color, social conditions, language, or religion, must be curbed and eradicated as incompatible with God's design. See how they twist it around? Inclusive language, I think, is one of the most damaging tools the liberals have ever offered. I, personally, and my community will not have inclusive language in our monastery or in our masses. It goes against our conscience. Nobody has the right to forbid me to say God is my father, Jesus became man. Nobody has that right. This monastery and these sisters will not have inclusive language, Bibles or missiles because we're not going to violate our conscience. The Lord Father sent his son to tell us that God is Father. Isn't that wonderful? 
You look at me, what do you say? Don't always, now don't say it for sure what you say, but you say Mother Angelica. You don't say hello television. I'm not a big box. You don't call me by what I do. You call me by my name. If you didn't, you wouldn't respect me. And, 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 and you, you would insult me. I can't insult God. He's my father. No, I can't do that. I don't think you have to do it either. Don't buy an inclusive language Bible. Somebody sent me one, I sent it back. It was some publisher. I said, no, I don't want this Bible. I want a Bible that has Father. I want a Bible that allows me to say world and mankind. All this is, is a lot of poppycock. Excuses to destroy the church. The church is no longer what it was. Somebody wrote me today, I get all kind of letters. <laughs> One said they have a purple altar now and a purple um, lectern and uh, little chairs, these folding chairs on the altar. Can you imagine that on Easter morning or at a wedding, being married at a purple altar? Why do we do such crazy things? Why do we insist on denying the reality of God? Not father, mother, father. I'm not gonna say it. Creator, redeemer, or sanctifier. I'm gonna say father, son, and Holy Spirit. I hope you do the same. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you from? I'm from Chicago, and my name is Giovanna. You got a gripe? Yes, I uh, thank you for the, for, uh, I thank you for the letter first that I received from you, and the beautiful picture of God. That's good. I treasure it, but I have something that's hurting me very deeply. Mm -hmm. My son was recently uh, diagnosed with a brain tumor. Mm. And when he was well, he had so many friends which he respect and treat him like brothers. Mm -hmm. Now that he is sick, everybody, everybody is uh, drove away from him. Aww. And it's hurting me so much that I find myself crying. But I need you to pray for me. I will. We're all gonna pray for you. You see, that's where we don't ex respect each other the way we are. And we're going to say, pray for your son. Lord Jesus, you have afflicted this boy with a brain tumor or permitted it in his life for a reason unknown to him or to us. You have permitted this I know, though, for his good. But we ask that you heal it. That whatever it is just goes away. Heal his friends. Heal his fear. Heal everything there is that prevents them from having that joy in the midst of suffering. We ask this to the power of Mary, our mother, who suffered so much with her son, and not too many stayed with her, John and a few women. Let us learn that lesson, Lord. We're such weak human beings, you know? We just don't seem to have that courage to love something ugly or something beautiful or something old or something young or we just pick and choose and and then we end up loving no one. I have to just give this this boy a, 
a lot of grace and a lot of healing. Amen. You know, so often, did you ever talk to an elderly person and they told you the same thing about 20 times? Huh? You ever, yeah? You know that? Yeah? They tell you and then about 20 minutes later they tell you the same thing over again? Well, if you want to really test your patience, see if you act as interested the 12th time as you did the first. That's respect. See? That's respect. We have a call. Hello? Hi, how you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. My name is Linda, and I'm calling from Pennsylvania. You got a gripe? Yes, I do. Good. You know what makes me mad? What? When you walk into a store, and the cashier on the other side is, is very miserable with you, mm -hmm. and they throw your change at you, yeah. they throw your packages at you, and you walk out of there being as miserable as they are, and it just ruins your whole day. Yeah. I think it's terrible. I, I don't understand. They, they just, you know, I always feel that they shouldn't be working with the public if that's how they're going to treat the people. Well, you know what? I, you could get even and smile and say, have a good day. <laughs> or, Jesus loves you. You'd be surprised how many people are miserable because they don't know that. I told it to a group one time of third order members. I said, I want you every day tell somebody Jesus loves them. And this one woman came up. She said, I did it. I did it. I said, what'd you do? She said, I went to the, the checkout counter. And the girl was so grouchy. I don't know. It does seem to have a, they must pick them that way. I don't know what it is. She, I don't know if they just... Maybe they're supposed to be that way, but I suppose if you just hung out money and you went like this all day long, you'd begin to go, oh. Might be very tiresome. Maybe that's all they are, tires. But anyway, she said, I said to her, Jesus loves you. Smile. And the woman looked at her and she said, I know. <laughs> Well, at least she knew. <laughs> Didn't do much for her, but she knew. But I would, I would say something nice and see what happens. I went to New York one time, and uh, I had a woman taxi uh, cab driver, and um, I said, hello. It seemed a nice thing to open up a conversation. Hello. Uh, so I waited a while, and I said, uh, you live in New York? Yes. Ooh. I said, uh, been driving a taxi long? <sighs> yes. Ooh. <laughs> I said, do uh, you enjoy it? <sighs> yes. I thought, well, I better keep quiet. <laughs> so I came out to come out of the cab, and she slammed the door, and she opened the back of the, the trunk, and, and she took my suitcases and dumped them on the ground. I looked at her, and I smiled. I gave her a tip, and I said, God bless you. And she looks at me, and tears start running down her cheeks. And she said, no, God bless you. See, that little thing, I don't even know what I did. I wanted to bop her at some point, but <laughs> I thought, no, you've got to be sweet. No, you got a habit on. You can't go around bopping people. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I see something happened. Maybe it none hurt her feelings one time. Maybe her teacher was nasty to her. Who knows what hurts people have that make them act the way they do. Now, if we could reverse that, by love, respect, a smile. You know something about that new commandment the Lord gave us? You know what it says? 
that I should love you as much as the Father loves Jesus. But he doesn't say anything about you loving me. Now, how do you like that? <laughs> he didn't say you got to go around loving somebody. He said, I have to love you as much as the Father loves me. He didn't say, now you're going to get a return of love. In fact, he said, if you do that, if you love those who love you, the pagans do that. If you invite somebody to dinner and hope they invite you back, he said, the pagans do that. You've got to invite people to dinner who won't invite you back. They don't have anything to invite you for. See, God doesn't think the way we do. We're, just, you know, we're so far away from the way God thinks. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother? Yes, where are you from? Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Do you have a gripe? Oh, yes. Um... <laughs> My problem is the church, uh, under the uh, pretext of mercy and uh, losing their material possessions, mm -hmm. won't speak out, won't uh, go uh, or, or fight for what is right. There's pornography in this town, and when I uh, discussed it, the priest told me that the... Uh, they would be tied down with illegal suits because of freedom of speech. Yeah. And I think that's a cop-out. I think that the church should be willing to give up all its uh, properties to defend or fight for what is right. And they also, in this diocese, promote um, gambling, de developing uh, Gambling addicts, uh, the law allows for $4,000 a night in bingo awards. So they run the games from 10 to 2 in the morning and give out 8000 Now, that's not entertainment. That's, that's something, well, pretty close to what the moth you'd expect from the mafia. And that's our church. The only well, thing I see lately is the Protestants or pushing the drug addicts off the streets with their clergymen. Why can't we have the priests roll up their sleeves and get out there and show us how to, to you know, defend our faith? They're too busy having bingo. <laughs> I hate bingo signs. I would uh, sign the back of a uh, car that said, uh, bingo. Keep your grandmother off the streets. <laughs> what kind of sign is that? Now, I, I, think, I think these bingo games are not what God wants. I really do. I never... 42, and everybody runs and puts a, a corn uh, thing on 42. See? And somebody else says, 56! Oh, my God! 56, and then you line them up some way, don't you? I don't know which way. I never played the game. And then there was somebody somewhere says, Bingo! And you look at your card and you're missing one number. What kind of game is that? I don't know. I think it's a lack of, of uh, confidence in the providence of God. It could have been an occasion of sin. Because people get a dino. An old lady used to spend all day. Bingo. See, I, I just wonder what happens to the mind, you know, when you're, that's all it's full of, and you got one foot in a grave. Why, why don't you start thinking of reading some good books or pass your time visiting other people? No, I don't think it's a proper role of the church to have bingo. I never did. Put a fervent holy priest in that pulpit. Let him call his people to holiness. Let him be compassionate. Let him be in that confessional when he's supposed to be. Let him give those sacraments with a self-sacrificing spirit. He will not have to worry about money, and he won't have to have bingo. The people will give on their own. And it's, 
Our Lord never said, blessed are those who have bingo games. <laughs> you know what else gripes me? These, these tickets you get in the mail. Tickets. See, you're not supposed to send tickets in the mail. It's against the law. I, I never buy them. I put them in a waste basket. It makes me so mad. See, we, we have to, the, the church belongs to God and the people, and the people are going to give. And if they don't, then we got to live within that boundary they give us. I think what we need to do tonight is to maybe just spend the rest of this evening not in what gripes us. We do have a lot of gripes. Maybe the rest of this time we'll put up, put up what pleases you the most? I bet we're not going to have any calls. Because we got more gripes than we have things that make us happy. Don't you think? See? They ain't nobody calling yet. <laughs> Not one person's called yet, but we had reverse everything. See, we got gripes. Now I want to know, what is it that makes you the happiest? Is it a sunrise, a sunset? Is it a call from your children? Is it when you go into chapel and sit down and, and just praise the Lord and just love him? Is it to see a procession with the blessed sacrament on down the street? I bet you say, it's a night away from my husband. <laughs> That's what you're going to say. Well, nobody is going to be talking about what pleases them because we just got three gripe calls. Okay, let's take the first gripe call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Yeah, where are you from? I'm from Garwood, New Jersey. And what is your gripe? Well, I was, for five months, I was out on disability after I had a stress breakdown. The, mm -hmm. uh, we live in an apartment, a two-family house. The people upstairs were making noise. The people next door were making noise. I couldn't get away from the noise. The job I took, I had been laid off from one, one job and got another job within a week later in the same industry in Newark, New Jersey. I hated it. Uh, I didn't like the boss. He was demanding. So I had a stress breakdown, and uh, the medicine they gave me for, to help me wasn't helping me, and it was causing me to sleep all day. My yeah. wife would come home and say, well, you're a lazy bum. You're sitting there laying on the couch all day. Make a long story short, I go back to work finally in a limousine business, and I work 73 hours a week. I say the rosary once a day mm -hmm. and the chaplet to St. Michael. I try to, I go to Mass every Sunday and sometimes during the week when I can. Mm -hmm. And my wife screams at me and yells at me and says that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I never, that she, her, and my daughter want to see me more. And, you know, I mean, first, of, first I'm a lazy bum and now I'm working too hard. And, 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 and I said to a priest today, Father, I says, I'm sorry if this is wrong about money, but money does make an easier life while you're in this world. But if this is what, if this is what God wants for me, I mean, if that's, that's his way of keeping me close to him, I guess it's working because I pray for my enemies. I have masses said for my enemies. I have masses said for the dead. I have masses said for the living, and I don't. Uh, want a pat on the back or anything. I just tell you that, you know, these are the kind of things that I do type of deal. Well, but see, the Lord is bringing you closer to himself. It doesn't matter whether your wife thinks it's you worked too hard and you didn't work at all. Maybe she needs some prayers. You know, some people you can't please. If, they have, if the room's too hot, then you open a window. Then it gets too cold, and you shut the window. Then it gets too hot, and you open the door. And then it gets too cold, you close the door. I can't please them, see. But you see, you can see, and you're seeing it yourself, that God is, is working in your in your life. See, spend more time with Him in between uh, calls, and and, uh, and and then that gives you a good chance, maybe, to talk to people that that you drive in your limousine. That you may be able to give them a holy card or or something. Work towards the Lord, and he'll take care of your wife. 
He will. We have another call. Hello? Hello. Where uh, are you from? I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Oh, you have a gripe? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> Everybody does. Okay, um... Uh, and I know it's not just my own gripe because I, I heard other people uh, mention it to me as well, so I thought I would c call in. Um, in confession, yeah. uh, now uh, I, and it happened actually to me and to a friend of mine as well. We went to confession, and I confessed something, and the priest told me it wasn't a sin. And, and I was not I, in no way being overscrupulous or... Uh, unusual in any way, but, and I'd read in, in countless books and articles that, that beha this behavior is sinful, and so I go and confess it, and then the priest, the priest smiles, and he says, oh, well, now we don't, we don't think that's a sin anymore, and, and mother, my, I mean, he absolved me, and, and, uh, and everything, but then he, you know, I, I really am at a loss. I don't know what to do. I would change confessors. See, he don't know what sides up. Um, I think you, you need to understand that there is such a thing as sin, and it's his duty as a priest. He has the power to forgive. And, and some things are sins. And I know that's a terrible teaching in the liberal theology. But you're right. You just go to another parish and go to another priest. Uh, you have a right as a Catholic to be forgiven your sins. And, and a priest does not have a right. Sometimes maybe some people get scrupulous, but you don't sound to me like you're scrupulous. And it seems to me you know what a sin is, and you committed that sin. And I would go to a priest who will give you absolution because you're sorry for having offended God. You see, so I'm sorry if so many people have to go through that. It's not necessary. There must be a priest in your city. Ask the Lord to send you one. We have another gripe. Hello? Uh, hello, Mother. Where First of all, let me let you know that you are positively not a gripe for me at all. <laughs> you are an you. absolute blessing and a gift, and so is EWTN. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I've been teaching high school for 19 years now in a public school system, and I find that each year students tend to be more and more impolite when it comes to common courtesies mm -hmm. toward each other, toward me, just little things like saying thank you, you're welcome, mm -hmm. please, and so forth. Right. I wonder if I'm uh, just grasping at trivialities by demanding that they show common courtesy to each other. Well, you see, if you don't have respect, you don't have courtesy. That's why I hate revolving doors. I, I will not go through a revolving door unless it's absolutely the only way to get in the building. One time I went to a place and I got in a revolving door, and of course I have a brace on, and I, it, it's difficult for me to go sometime as fast as these revolving doors go. And these kids got behind me and just pushed me around. See? And, and you can't do anything. A total disrespect for another person. And I think then you need to teach your students to be respectful because it's the womanly and manly thing to do. I don't think they know. I really don't. Nobody tells them that this is a, this is a, the, the, a virtue of someone that's strong. To say thank you, please, may I, to give us your seat in the bus to someone. But see, when feminists demand to be equal in all things to men, then let them stand. Why should a man rise? Why should a man rise for someone who says, hey, I'm as good as you are, I can do the same things you do? No, you can't. So, you see, that's when, when we go against the law of God, a million things follow after. None of them good. So, you, you 
teach them to be respectful and let them know. You know, I had a, there used to be a brothers, what were they called? Uh, mm, anyway, they had a kind of a, a, a collar that went this way. And they were teaching brothers. And there was a new brother came in, and this man was a, um, this young boy was a kind of bully, you know, and, and uh, they were Christian brothers, that's who it is. And uh, so he, the teacher came in, he had this little thing on, and, and uh, so this little bully got in, and he said, you always look like a girl. And the brother didn't do anything, he just went to the seat, he took the kid up like this, and the kid was a little fat little kid, you know, and he pulled him out, out of his seat like this with one hand. And he said, I used to be a boxer. Would you like to go outside? <laughs> and the kid said no, so he dropped them. Clunk. <laughs> right in his seat. He never had another problem in that whole class. See? Today we call it abuse. I call it smart. <laughs> so, next week, we're going to have all the happy calls. I want to know next Tuesday, what are you happy about? What's so sad sometimes, some people don't have much to be happy about. But maybe if you tell me what you're happy about, then somebody else will tell us what they're happy about. If things go wrong in your life, we must all be happy over the reality that God loved me before time began. That the Father cherishes me as an only child that he created me out of nothing, just so he could hear me say, Father, I love you. Ah, oh, that ought to make you happy. Makes me happy. The Spirit is our life. Let us be directed by the Spirit. Let us be directed by the Spirit to his Lord and God and Father so that our lives will be like Jesus. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God, man. We'll be back tomorrow evening. Bye now. Order this episode of Mother Angelica Live Classics from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store. Log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Or call 1-800-854-6316. Lent is a time to give back to basics. Christianity is a religion of love. And love is being generous, it's being kind, it's being merciful, it's being respectful. This is what Lent is about. And if we can live a significant Lent, a life-changing Lent, then we will be doing God's will. By the grace of God, you may not be perfect, but you can go forward. Saul Alinsky was a 20th century American radical. Today, he's best known as the father of community organizing. The goal of Alinsky organizing is to restructure society according to a, a statist model, a collectivist model, and to restructure the church to support that. Socialists strive to bring the overthrow of all civil society. And the last is like a gray wolf neither black nor white, but gray in their cunning. All life is warfare. The end justifies almost any means.
Hi, I'm Johnette Williams. While the New Testament teaches us the ways of Christ, the perfect summary is given to us by our Lord Himself in the eight Beatitudes, declarations of blessedness that mark the way to holiness of life and a Christ-like witness in the world. We'll talk about it with our guest, Father Sebastian White. That's Women of Grace. Today at 1 p.m. Eastern, here on EWTN. Dear brothers and sisters, I am Father Alexander Zelinsky. I am responsible for EWTN Ukraine, and I am in our uh, chapel in Kyiv, uh, where is our office of EWTN Ukraine. Uh, we, all the people in Ukraine, uh, are in not easy time for us, very difficult time for us, the, uh, the, the time of war, uh, the time where when uh, many people uh, feel uh, fear, many people feel distress and uh, we want to thank you for all of your prayers for us for all of your support we want to uh, ask you for prayer we don't know we, what will be our future but we believe that we are in the hands of god we want to to trust god and we want to ask you for for this prayer for us, for our country, for our uh, people, and also for our EWTN Ukraine's uh, team. We, as EWTN Ukraine, try to, to preach uh, this good news, the God's hope. Uh, we try to support people and uh, uh, please help us to, to your prayers, to your support. God bless you. Amen. To donate to the Ukraine Solidarity Fund through the Knights of Columbus, go to kofc.org forward slash Ukraine. Well, the beautiful thing about this show is it's not just for Catholics, it's for everybody. The reason why is we all need divine mercy. As Jesus told St. Faustina, divine mercy is mankind's last hope of salvation. This is an opportunity for you to understand divine mercy because remember, the saints tell us, you can't love what you don't know. And all of us could learn our faith and about our God a little bit more so that we can love our faith and love our God even that much more. Living Divine Mercy, Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. Eastern, here on EWTN. Our Catholic faith gives us a time of the year to experience a conversion, but it's not something that should happen just one time a year. In fact, conversion should happen every day of our life. But what exactly does conversion mean so that we can understand we're supposed to experience a change, not just once a year? For us, conversion can come from an understanding of turning towards each other rather than turning away from each other. And that's why Christ calls us to turn to him. And he is so brilliant that he uses the experience of a sacred meal to experience a deeper conversion. Because it is a meal that can bring our families all together. If we don't, we can experience diversions. And that root word is the same as divorce. We've got to understand that Christ is the one who can bring us all together so that we can experience another idea of conversion, which literally means change. And Jesus uses another food analogy from the prophet of Isaiah. We hear that a conversion is like taking spears and turning them into plowshares, swords into pruning hooks. In other words, take the part of us that causes harm and use the Lord's grace to help us to become that which can actually feed one another. 
To get showtimes for Father Leo's weekly program, Savoring Our Faith, go to EWTN.com slash Savoring Our Faith. St. Joseph, Light of Patriarchs.